Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back to Vrax and the Red Scorpion's resolve to finally end the protracted conflict. The first blow would be struck by a veteran Sergeant Cullen of the First Company, leading his own vanguard elites and assault troops from two other companies. They were to take out the fortified bunkers on the southern edge of the Pilgrim's Road, protecting the main armoured thrust towards the St. Leonis Gate. To aid him in this endeavour, the chapter had also placed Thunderhawks under his command. They were to initiate a bombing run upon the positions before the assault marines were to rush forward. The Thunderhawks would be equipped with specially designed plasma warhead made not to explode, but instead cover a vast area in boiling, seething tides of plasma. The extreme heat and light emitted by this weaponry would make it very difficult indeed for the defenders to operate effectively, whilst the space marines encased in their power armour would be hindered not at all. And using this cover to close the distance of the bunkers, they would then engage them, crack them open with shaped melter charges, and butcher the subhuman heretics inside. The Varaxians, or at this point, more like the purely chaos heretics, would be hard pressed to even withstand and much less repel the Space Marine assault, but speed was nevertheless of the essence. The bunkers would have to be knocked out quickly and comprehensively, lest they catch the Red Scorpion's armoured spearhead pushing up the Pilgrim Road in an enfilade fire, alongside the guns of the Citadel itself. And those guns also contributed to the second reason why the assault marines needed to hurry. Once they began their assault upon the bunker complexes on the southern slopes, they would be left completely exposed to the Citadel guns, having to fight the bunkers, their crews, and the gunners up upon the walls. They would be exposed to plunging fire, and the only cover around would be the enemy's very own bunkers. If they could not gain access to them swiftly, the assault marines may be caught in the open and annihilated under a blitzing torrent of heavy firepower. But hey, what's life without a little danger, eh? And so, veteran Sergeant Cullen led his vanguard elites and the assault squads in against the bunkers right after the Thunderhawks had roared in above, delivering their plasma warhead payload. They quickly gained access to the first bunkers, blasting them open and destroying the anti-tank crews within. The enemy defenders, however, acted with surprising swiftness to the Red Scorpion's assault. Once a bunker had fallen, it was immediately hammered by suppressing fire from the nearby gun emplacements, peppering the positions of their former friends, making it difficult for the Red Scorpions to move on. It was clear that this attack would not benefit from any sort of surprise, the enemy clearly having reacted to the capture of the lower gate spur by reinforcing these sectors. The wisdom of sending in the first company's vanguard elites was now proven. If it was just the assault marines, their lack of heavy infantry weaponry may have seen them permanently pinned in to their captured positions. But with the vanguards boasting an impressive array of varied weaponry, as each and every veteran carried with him the weapon and equipment he was most familiar with, they could bring to bear plasma guns, flamers, rocket launchers, and a wide variety of other weaponry. Able to engage the Vraxian defenders, they could provide suppressive fire, buying the assault squads the seconds of time they needed to burst out from concealment, activate their jump pags, and blitz across the open landscape towards the next bunker. All the assault squads would ever need was a handful of seconds. They would reach the emplacement, place melter charges on several weak points, detonate them with loud shrieks of superheated air as the melter charges burned their way through the enemy's defences. Thereafter, the assault marines would be inside the bunker, protected from the enemy's fire, and butchering the defenders within with near impunity. Unfortunately, the rest of the Red Scorpion strike force could not wait for veteran Sergeant Cullen and his forces to complete the purge of the bunker complex. Instead, they had to launch themselves towards the St. Leonis Gate before the enemy was given too much warning. 
Because if the enemy was allowed to gather too much forces near the St. Leonis Gate, the tunnel leading up to and through the gate could become a major obstacle to the Red Scorpions. And so, without a whole lot of time to waste, Commander Ortiz ordered the preparatory assaults to begin. The first phase would see a wing of Thunderhawk transports screaming in towards the St. Leonis Gate, hammering it with repeated missile strikes. The next would have the land speeder formations begin their journey towards the front line, speeding low at first to avoid detection and then rising up into the air. They would hit the walls just as the mechanized formations began to move, suppressing the enemy's wall defenses as they went. And finally, whirlwind batteries would strike at the walls themselves. This was not expected to achieve over much, but it was thought it was worth a try. If the whirlwinds were able to overload the void shields in this area, a long shot to be sure, but not impossible as they had been hammered by the Death Corps for months at this point, then the whirlwinds could do what the battle barge was supposed to, delivering a blocking artillery barrage to keep the enemy's reinforcements from flooding into the St. Leonis Gate. And whilst I'm sure that Commander Ortis would be most disappointed indeed to not be able to use his very largest stick, the whirlwinds were assuredly a far more precise weapon than a battle barge. But the whirlwind rockets reaching up into the sky and then falling down at sharp angles impacted upon the defender's void shields and exploded. The defenses would not be overwhelmed, at least not by this. And so High Commander Ortis shrugged his massive power armored shoulders and probably gleefully informed his commanders that yes, the large stick would indeed become necessary. And with that, he left his command rhino and strode over to the lead land raider. Entering through one of the side hatches, he took his place at the head of the transport compartment, ready to lead his battle brothers in the moment the land raiders reached the St. Leonis Gate. With a clipped voice command, he ordered the mechanized formation to begin moving. The proper assault would now commence. The Red Scorpion force would be spearheaded by three land raiders. It was hoped that their additional armor and their considerable armaments package would be able to withstand the worst of what the enemy could throw at them, whilst also being able to respond in kind. It was hoped that the armored thrust would be swift and direct towards the St. Leonis Gate, but the Pilgrim Road had already been the scene of fairly heavy fighting. The advance and then the subsequent retreat of the Black Brethren of Ares down it, and the response of the Grey Knights when they chased it back up it, had left the road pockmarked and heavily cratered. Normally, the road may even have been considered to be outright unusable for a mechanized assault, but the Red Scorpion dismissed this as a limitation placed purely upon mortal troops. The Red Scorpion transports would be driven by veterans of the chapter, and they had traversed far worse ground than this. And so at speeds that seemed guaranteed to at the very least throw a track, or at worst, tip the entire transport over, they raced up the Pilgrim Road. Additional difficulties were encountered when they reached areas of the Pilgrim Road that had once been steps, this having been essentially a footpath back in the day when pilgrims were traveling up it towards the Basilica of St. Leonis. These steps had been reduced to nothing more than piles of rubble when the Black Brethren stormed down the road, and now they were little more than piles of rubble and rebar, presenting potential hazards to the tracks of the rhinos. They could easily get entangled, or if they got caught in a bad position, get ripped off entirely. And due to the narrow nature of the road, if a rhino got stuck here, there would be no other option than to simply push it off the side and into the deep ravine to the right. Even the Death Corps of Krieg had balked at such instructions, to simply push their comrades and their war machines off a steep cliff. If the Red Scorpions would do the same was a question that the Lord Commander hoped he would not have to find the answer to. And despite the best efforts and the skill of the drivers, these portions were forcing the spearhead to slow down, and they were beginning to take concentrated fire from the wall guns. 
Off to the right, Veteran Sergeant Cullen had still not completed the clearing of the bunker complexes, and there were fire coming in from that direction as well, but it was light and disorganised. Whatever the Veteran Sergeant was doing, it was clearly working. Up above, the landspeeders now also made their entrance. Zooming in close to the wall at high speed, strafing it with rocket pods and heavy bolters. They were, in reality, doing little more than chipping the permacrete, but it would at least encourage some of the defenders to keep their heads down and their aim off the Red Scorpions. But whether or not it would be enough was an entirely different question. Inside of the first Land Raider, it was getting hit so rapidly and so consistently that the very walls shook, and it was a deafening cacophony inside, as an endless stream of heavy bolter and auto cannon rounds hammered into the Land Raider's hull. It really did become a question of simple math. With tens of thousands of projectiles raining down upon the relatively thin upper hull of the Land Raider, it was only a question of time before one of them found a way through. A round sliced through the upper armour and straight into the vulnerable engine compartment, tumbling around in it and wrecking terrible damage upon the machine within. This alone was not enough to cripple the squat, heavily armoured vehicle, but it did cause a momentary loss of power. The Land Raider slowed, and now it was not only the lead vehicle, it was also the slowest and easiest to hit. And so the intensity of the bombardment drawn by the Land Raider increased proportionally. Within seconds, the enemy's weaponry was doing far more than simply knocking at the hull. Penetrations were coming in quick and thick, blasting apart the engine compartment and also damaging several internal components. Aboard, Lord Commander Ortiz made the decision to evacuate the Land Raider. He hammered down upon the release switch for the assault ramp, but it would not budge. The weapons fire had already disabled it along with the engines. Over the Vox, the driver was urging everybody to immediately evacuate the Land Raider, as the second vehicle in the column would have no choice but to push the vehicle out of the way. But with the Chapter Master on board, they could not do so until he had extricated himself from the wreck. On Ortiz's side, he was painfully aware that every second spent waiting for him to get out was one more moment wasted, where his mechanized spearhead was no spearhead at all, but instead nothing more than target practice for the wall gunners. And so Commander Ortiz, reaching into the mechanism holding the assault ramp open, tore them out, destroying them utterly, then ordered the rest of the Battle Brothers inside of the Land Raiders troop compartment to help him push the massive solid slab of armoured metal down. Even with the combined strength of Ortis and three other Battle Brothers, it took yet more precious seconds before their combined weight and strength were able to tip the assault ramp over its tipping point and send it crashing down to the ground outside. At the very same instant, Commander Ortis and the rest of the Space Marines aboard the Land Raider stormed outside and began searching for whatever cover they could whilst picking their way forward to the St. Leonis Gate. Receiving the word that the Chapter Master had evicted the vehicle, the second Land Raider in the line rammed the first one aside, although a little bit gingerly, pushing it over to the side of the road, which would leave just barely enough room for the second Land Raider to pass without having to tip the venerable old machine over the edge. This moment of hesitation and mercy, however, would force the second Land Raider to reverse a short distance and then swerve around the now disabled Land Raider, putting it all the way onto the shoulder of the road, where it struck a hidden mine, blasting off its leftmost track and rendering the second Land Raider immobilized right besides the first, creating a full blockade of the path forward. What was supposed to have been a rapid and overwhelming mechanized assault had now been transformed by a combination of enemy fire and hesitation into a foot slog. As now that there was nowhere for the remaining rhinos to go, and the third land raider could not push both of the preceding ones off the path, the Red Scorpions were forced to disembark and begin climbing the rest of the Pilgrim Road on foot and there was yet more than half of it left to go. As the Space Marines began climbing up the Pilgrim Road, the armoured elements withdrew a short distance and began aiding the landspeeders in suppressing the wall-mounted defences. 
This would result in heavy casualties amongst the tanks and the armoured personnel carriers of the Red Scorpions. Now that they were dueling directly with the wall-mounted guns, they became the primary targets of their retaliatory fire. But whilst they were being destroyed in considerable numbers, they did provide valuable relief for the now foot-bound Astartes. But even though they had been dismounted, that did not necessarily slow them down over much. A space marine is capable of covering even the most difficult terrain with extraordinary speed, and the Red Scorpions, led by Commander Ortiz, were making very good progress indeed towards the lower gate. So much indeed that the enemy clearly decided it was necessary to slow down their advance. The lower gates parted, and the Black Brethren of Ares once again sallied out from them, but this time their numbers were much reduced, and they were not supported by the same horde of demonic war machines as their counterattack against the Death Corps. Clearly, the Grey Knights had cut into their numbers considerably. That did not, however, mean that they were lacking in numbers. The Black Brethren of Ares were followed down the Pilgrim Slope by hordes of degenerate cultists and mutated monstrosities, and within a minute or so, the Red Scorpions slammed into the incoming horde of Black Brethren and their chaotic allies, the two sides impacting with a thunderclap, first of Ceramite clashing against Ceramite, and then swiftly being replaced by a howl of chainswords, the bark of bolters, and the shriek of mutated creatures. And at the forefront of it all was Commander Ortis, standing like a castle wall, batting aside Chaos Space Marine and charging mutants one by one. His brilliantly arcing and blazing power sword cutting a glowing path through the traitors, and also acting like a beacon of resistance for his brethren, who fought on yet harder for seeing it. But soon, the two sides were at a complete standstill. The Black Brethren of Ares were veterans of many a campaign, and were a match for even the Red Scorpions. And the tides of howling degenerates throwing themselves against the Red Scorpions were more of a nuisance than anything, but locked in a struggle with a force every bit their equal, that nuisance could be more than enough to tip the tide of battle. Commander Ortis was faced with a difficult decision. Either he ordered the land speeders to disengage from the wall guns and begin strafing the hordes pouring out from the lower St. Leonis gate, or he risked being overrun, but doing so would free up the gate gunners and allow them to concentrate on his Astartes, now without the protection of their armoured vehicles. But speaking of those armoured vehicles, they were also living on borrowed time. The longer the Red Scorpions would require them to keep up a covering barrage along with the land speeders, the fewer of them would be able to survive. The Predators, the remaining Land Raider, and the Rhinos and the Razorbacks were all commanded and driven by veteran troops. They were able to jinx and jostle their way on the limited surface available to them quite effectively, and their armour was no laughing matter. But there was a lot of guns, and sooner or later, as ably demonstrated by the land raiders themselves, a round would find its way through. Throwing caution to the wind, Lord Commander Ortiz ordered the land speeders to refocus on the enemy infantry, and soon they began swooping down across the hordes still streaming out of the lower gate. Strafing them with heavy bolters and rockets, they were blasting huge chunks out of the assaulting forces, giving the Red Scorpions just enough of a breathing space to begin pushing forward and securing a real foothold. Once they were properly organized, a volley upon volley of bolter fire could keep the area in front of the Red Scorpions open, and the chapter's elites, commanded by Ortiz himself, could launch counterattacks to push back the enemy. This eventually resulted in enough space being gained for the chapter's dreadnoughts to be brought up. They had previously been relegated to the rearward areas, unable to maneuver effectively in the throng, and unable to withdraw either due to the mechanized elements requiring all the space that was available. But now, they had been given enough room to begin maneuvering again, making their way over to the cliffside, facing up towards the curtain walls. Using their bipedal locomotion, they began climbing up the steep side, grabbing onto it with their 
paths and dragging themselves up and out from the general melee. Soon they gained elevated positions with improvised footholds or small plateaued areas along the side of the cliff. Most of these ancient machines had been equipped specifically to fulfill a fire support role, to shatter hordes just like the one they were currently facing, although they were meant to engage them within the confined spaces of the long tunnels leading up to the St. Leonis Gate. But their weapons were just as effective here. Soon, rocket pods, auto cannons, heavy bolters, and even plasma cannons began gouging vast holes in the charging horde, and their weaponry was more than accurate and devastating enough to pick out the Black Brethren as well and eliminate them with extreme prejudice, whilst not endangering the Red Scorpions. Finding themselves under fire by the dreadnoughts from on the cliff, from above by the land speeders, and engaged with the unyielding wall of red scorpions to their front, the Black Brethren of Ares began withdrawing, throwing their puppet soldiers and their abominations in front of them to allow themselves to escape back into the lower gate. The Red Scorpions had withstood the enemy's counterattack and repulsed it, but now they had to hurry. They had to pursue the Black Brethren and quickly, gaining the protection of the lower gatehouse, otherwise the weapons built into the bastion walls would swiftly begin targeting them once again. And now that the land speeders had been forced to break off and engage the horde of infantry, they would be able to engage the Red Scorpions with full efficiency. Still at the head of the advance, Commander Ortis, raising his power sword, waved his battle brothers forward, and they began rushing up towards the lower gate. Reaching it, he took a second to reorganize his troops and prepare them for the breach of the gate. This would be the do or die moment. The Red Scorpions would have to cut their way through the defenders, still numbering in the thousands with Chaos Space Marine support, and up the lengthy tunnel to the St. Leonis Gate. And this would all have to be be done quickly, because if it was not, uh, then they might very well be checked and held outside of the gate, as they had already feared. In such a situation, the Red Scorpions would slowly but surely be picked apart. But before any attempt could be made to breach the gate, it once again began to grind open. Commander Ortiz dropped into a fighting stance and prepared himself to meet yet another wave of traitors and Chaos Space Marines. But this time, he would be faced with something far more horrendous. The Black Brethren and the initial counterattack had all been done purely to gain time to make sure that the rituals were completed in the correct fashion and guided towards the appropriate target. Out of the lower gate now came yet another horde of howling demons and monsters spawned forth from the warp, and they met the Red Scorpions head-on in point-blank fighting. Initially, the Red Scorpions were tossed backwards, Lord Commander Ortis standing in the middle of a seething tide of demons laying about him in all directions with his power sword, barely keeping them at a distance. As their hellish weaponry carved through power armor as if knives through butter, the casualties swiftly began mounting. The land speeders once again swooped down to add their own firepower to the heaving mass of melee. It was time for Lord Commander Ortis to play his trump card. Calling down his Terminator elites, locking down onto his own power-armoured suit's beacon, they appeared in the middle of the battlefield. An exceptionally risky deployment of the First Company's veterans, as they could very easily have ended up within the cliff wall to the left, or right above the vast chasm to the right. The timely intervention of the Terminator elites equipped for close quarters battle with lightning claws and thunder hammers tore into the demons and halted the almost rout-like conditions coursing through the Red Scorpions. With the Terminators at the head and Lord Commander Ortis leading them, the Red Scorpions began pushing back, trying to make for the gate opening. If they could gain entry into the bastion itself, at the very least they would gain cover from the wall guns who were now beginning to train more and more upon the Red Scorpions instead of their armoured elements. 
The land raiders once again found themselves forced to retarget the wall guns to ensure that the heavy batteries did not begin raining down on the scorpions, especially not now that they were caught in a life or death struggle with the demons of chaos. The combat flowed back and forth for several savage minutes, the Red Scorpion's casualties mounting drastically. First, the banner bearer of the first company fell to a juggernaut, moments before it was dispatched by a point-blank plasma blast, sending it screaming back into the immaterium. Then, veteran chaplain Nair fell as well, pierced through the torso by a screeching hellblade as the chaplain stood astride half a dozen demonic carcasses. But no sooner had Nair fallen than the next chaplain stepped into the line, this from the second company, who immediately took up his venerable predecessor's role, chanting out liturgies of hatred and repellence, along with prayers against corruption and possession. This was not merely an enemy that had to be fought on the physical plane, but also one that must be resisted by all means on a spiritual level. But despite the best efforts of the Red Scorpions, the tide of demons seemed to have no end as they kept simply pouring out of the gatehouse. They began overwhelming the Terminator elites, dragging them down one by one and then cutting them to pieces. Tactical Dreadnought armor was able to withstand even the Hellblades of the demons, but once they lost their footing, they were quickly overwhelmed, and dozens of claws and yet more screeching sores hammered into their thick plates, tearing them apart section by section, until finally the soft flesh beneath was exposed to their none too tender administrations, ripping them apart and bathing in the fountains of blood jetting out of their ruined corpses. As always, at the front, High Commander Ortiz was fighting for his very life, in one of the most savage confrontations he had ever been involved in. He saw the Terminator to his right killed by a huge claw wielded by a half-demon, half-man creature, possibly one of the Red Hunters that had been possessed. Regardless of what it was, it was strong enough to tear half of a Terminator captain's torso clear from the rest of his body. Commander Ortiz swiftly lunged towards the half-human, half-demon monster, impaling it through the head with his power sword. But even as the abomination died, it whipped out in a snake-like movement, slamming into the High Commander's cuirass, shattering it and the solid wall of bone in his chest, sending him flying heavily wounded smashing into the cliff wall and landing awkwardly, breaking his helmet upon impact with the cliff. The commander was dazed and very close to passing out. Through foggy vision, he saw a pair of apothecaries begin to rush towards him to stabilize and hopefully save their commander's life. But as he saw them, he also caught a glimpse of movement out of the corner of his eye. Just as he was preparing to give the order for the Red Scorpion assault to begin their withdrawal, lest they all be slaughtered, seeing as they could not break through the demons, and thusly they would soon be bracketed and annihilated by the wall guns, a flash of light made him halt. Suddenly, the demons were being attacked from above. Veteran Sergeant Cullen had completed his task of clearing out the bunker complex, and now, along with the assault specialists of two companies and his own vanguard elites, they were slamming into the demons who had not seen them coming. Flamers, plasma guns, multi-melters, crack grenades, and frags began detonating in their midst, followed in seconds later by roaring chain swords, lashing chain axes, and power swords. Such was the ferocity of this unexpected assault that the demons began wavering, their connection to the mortal world almost completely severed. As he saw this, Commander Ortiz, despite his wound, shrugged off the administrations of his apothecarians, raised his fist towards the sky, and bellowed at the top of his enhanced voice for the Red Scorpions to make one last ferocious push for the gate. 
as one, they surged forward and overran the demons. They were cutting them down now by the dozens, and soon they became immaterial, incorporeal, and began fading back into the immaterium. One second they were there, real and deadly as anything, and the next they were nothing more than screams carried on the wind. And with the disappearance of the demons, the path towards the lower gateway was also left open and unguarded. The traitors had miscalculated. Up until now, the demons had been the ultimate trump card, able to repel almost any incursion, but this time they had failed. The traitors desperately tried to close the gate, and did barely just manage so, but not before the assault marines were flush up against it, placing melter charges and blasting new holes through it, through which they immediately leapt. Now, the remaining human defenders were in close quarters combat with the assault marines, and the majority of the garrison had been evacuated, lest they get embroiled into the combat with the demons. Swiftly, the assault marines overcame the little resistance within it and began opening the gates once more. Not needing to be asked twice, the remaining red scorpions poured into the lower gatehouse and out of reach of the wall gunners. And with the enemy having committed their demons to the battle, they had failed to adequately prepare for their defeat. There was no massive reserve of enemies able to pour down the tunnel and check the Red Scorpion's further advance. And so, boosting up the long tunnels, the assault marines led the charge, swiftly infiltrating the main bastion, followed in by tactical marines, and then the lumbering terminators, Ortis ever again leading the charge of the Red Scorpions. His power sword had been lost at some point during the melee, but he had picked up a bloodied and battered chain sword, and he would not stop until the bastion itself was completely in their hands, despite the protestations of the Apothecarians. And with the St. Leonis Gate firmly in the hand of the Red Scorpions, they could now fortify it, prepared to repulse any attacks and also bring in the support of the Battle Barge. Anything that would be moving towards it would have to get through its line of fire, assuming it could barrel its way through the Void Shields, but that was a reasonable enough bet. The Red Scorpions had, however, suffered heavily in doing so. Well over half of the brothers that had begun the assault would never again leave Vrax. And on the other side of the fortress, where the diversionary attack from the Red Scorpions were attacking the Great Gate, they were not making any real progress. But as a diversion, their operation may have been a success. Lord Commander Ortiz did notice that the weight of fire coming down upon his Red Scorpions had been less than he had anticipated, and even the disabling of two of the Land Raiders to begin with had not caused them as much trouble as he may have expected. Clearly, the enemy was beginning to run out of manpower reserves themselves, as that could not have been the full firepower of the wall guns. Even with the land speeders flitting about and firing at them, he had feared far worse. Maybe the enemy had not so much miscalculated when they trusted the counterattack to the demons. It was entirely possible that they simply had no other choice. The remaining forces within the bastion, made up of a small number of brethren of Ares and mostly human and chaotic militia, had been swiftly overrun after the demons had fully dissipated. Perhaps the enemy was finally reaching the end of the line, although Commander Ortis would take nothing for granted just yet. He would dig in his remaining red scorpions and wait to see the outcome of the other assaults. The attack upon the Great Gate did not appear to be overly promising, and the Death Corps diversionary attack, not much more. But the Grey Knights and the Inquisitor were yet to make their move. Perhaps a second breach of the Citadel could yet be achieved. And on the other side of the front, Lord Inquisitor Hector Rex and his assault force were standing ready to begin their own offensive. 
The Death Corps of Krieg had already launched their attack upon the northern outskirts of the Citadel, and that was going pretty much as always with mounting casualties. But it was hoped that with the Red Scorpions pushing in the south and against the Great Gate along with the Death Corps, the Cardinal Gate would be left relatively unguarded. And so that was where the Inquisitor and the Grey Knights would strike. They would be led in by Brother Captain Arturus, leading in his Terminators and Purgation squads, along with several other groupings made up of Inquisitors and their various retinues. They would be borne forward both in the private vehicles of the Inquisitors and the Rhinos and Land Raiders of the Grey Knights. And they had all brought their finest for this confrontation. Rex himself was wearing a specially crafted and extraordinarily ornate suit of Terminator grade power armor, larger even than the suits worn by many of the Grey Knights. It was an artifice of incalculable value and age, and even it was outshone by the weapon he carried, the sword Arius, said to have been blessed by the God Emperor himself. If such rumours were even remotely true, then that artifact alone would be worth more than an entire system of planets. Raising the glorious artifact high above his head, he let it fall, and as such the signal was given. The strike force began moving forward, with the Grey Knight Land Raiders in the lead, driving at a walking pace alongside the Terminators and the Purgation squads, with the Lord Inquisitor in the lead. Behind them came the rest of the Inquisitors, their retinues, and the Red Hunters who were mixed in alongside them. With yet more rhinos and tanks, they began a slow and yet steady advance upon the enemy's defences. This was a truly magnificent force. The Grey Knights had already broken the back of the Brethren of Ares during the fight against the Lower Gate Spur, and now there would be no reinforcements, they would be the main force. Indeed, so powerful was this attack that the Red Hunters and the rest of the Inquisitors, armed and armoured with all manners of exotic and specialised weaponry, were but the second wave. The slog towards the Cardinal Gate was expected to be the most difficult portion of the attack. The Grey Knights, Inquisitors, Red Hunters, and of course Lord Hector Rex himself would have to advance towards the fortified gatehouse in a phalanx formation, utilising the super heavy armour of the Grey Knights and the various Inquisitors to weather the storm of defensive fire that the wall guns would undoubtedly pour into them. Once they finally made it to the Cardinal Gate, it would be breached by a combination of melter charges and the firepower of the Land Raiders. Then the Cardinal Gate itself would be seized and held open for yet further reinforcements. It would be a slow and bloody advance, or at least so that was the expectation. But before this strike force had even made it halfway to the Cardinal Gate, the massive armoured bastion began slowly but surely to pull apart, opening. It was so far away it was almost difficult to discern at first, but then a massive horde of mortals, demons, chaos marines and all manners of horrifying creatures began spilling out, led by a group of massive brass scorpions. This was unexpected. The enemy had always counter-attacked before, to be certain, but they had always waited for the guns to do most of the heavy lifting, trusting in the counter-attack to shatter the Imperial's resistance and send them fleeing. This was not only an unusual move, but also an exceedingly unwise one. Whilst ensconced behind their walls, the defenders had every advantage. They could continue peppering the attackers with heavy weaponry for minutes, if not hours, before they were in any position to breach the gates, and only then did they have to commit themselves to an open attack. Now they were exposing themselves not only to the guns of the Red Hunters, Grey Knights, Inquisitors, but also to the heavy artillery of the Death Corps of Krieg. Devoid of the protection of their void shields, they were little more than a screaming unorganised horde that had blundered onto a free fire zone. 
so unexpected was the attack that they were even able to cover a considerable distance towards the strike force before the artillery could react. Of course, the Grey Knights, Inquisitors and Red Hunters had no such impediment. The moment they confirmed that the enemy was sallying out, every weapon began hosing down the attackers. But clearly, the blood-maddened worshippers of Korn had not yet abandoned all tactical acumen. The front forces were made up of the massive brass scorpions, weaponry easily comparable to super-heavy tanks, yet considerably faster and more agile. Propelled quickly forward on several impossibly spindly legs, they began closing the distance with the Inquisitor's strike force, and flanked on all sides by bloodletters, flesh hounds, and juggernauts, they presented their enemies with a veritable wall of living metal. Almost any other force in the galaxy would undoubtedly have been crushed before the bloodthirst and savagery of this unnatural foe. But once again, this was precisely the kind of enemy the Grey Knights had been created to fight. Their land raiders began firing, and their infantry began disembarking. Phalanxes of Grey Knights Terminators, along with incinerators and psi cannons, began scything into the enemy. These specially designed shells slashed through the unnatural armor of even the brass scorpions with comparative ease. Every blast of a psi cannon destroyed a dozen foe, and scorching fans of blessed fire covered the front line, banishing demons by the score. Despite the thousands upon thousands of demons streaming towards them, the Grey Knight barely broke their pace. They continued forward, slowly, doggedly, and determinedly, land raiders grinding alongside the squads, cutting down the enemy as quickly as they could issue forth from the gate. And with blazing, annihilating firepower scourging everything before them, the Grey Knights and the Lord Inquisitor advanced towards the Cardinal Gate. But the enemy simply would not stop. They were issuing forth from the gate in such numbers, in such a tide, that the Grey Knights could not kill them quickly enough. Soon they began swarming and lapping around the Grey Knights, engaging the rest of the strike force, which was soon on the verge of being surrounded. The Inquisitors, along with the Red Hunters and their Stormtrooper allies, were blazing away with every weaponry as fast as they could, but the Horde would not be denied. Soon, the Grey Knights and the Inquisitor had become almost a detached spear tip, pushing forward to the gate. The Lord Inquisitor, having reasoned that if only it could be blocked by the Grey Knights and his personal retinue, then the rest of the strike force could deal with the enemies already outside without the fear of yet further thousands issuing forth from the gate and drowning them in sheer numbers. But despite the apparent threat, Lord Hector Rex nevertheless was given pause for all of this. The enemy seemed to be throwing their lives away with remarkable carelessness. It's not like they didn't know that the Grey Knights were here. It's not like they did not know what they were capable of. The Black Brethren of Ares had already suffered quite badly at their hands. And even if they saw some advantage in issuing forth and engaging the enemy in open battle, they must have realized that this was far from the optimal way of doing things. And whilst the enemy might be chaotic, they were also clever, vile, and deceitful. Even the bloodthirsty worshippers of Korn would not do something like this without a reason. And then it struck him. The enemy wouldn't do this without a reason, and that reason was the very same why the Lord Inquisitor was even here in the first place. He had come specifically to prevent the servants of the vile Chaos Gods from turning Vrax into a demon world, and this appeared to be the very height of that ritual. As he noticed this, he felt a slight tingling at the edge of his senses, and noticed that everything had grown unnaturally dark. He had been somewhat preoccupied with the enemy attempting to tear his throat out, and yet this came as a shock to him. The ritual was far too advanced. And from high above, as if all other sounds had simply ceased for a moment, the sound 
of ginormous flapping wings could be heard. But this was no descent of angels. What came down from the heavens above, backlit by a sudden rolling thunderstorm that appeared seemingly out of nowhere, was a huge bat-winged monstrosity with skin the colour of coagulated and rotted blood. It descended untouched, as if the whole battle held its breath as it arrived, landing on the parapet at the very heart of the Cardinal Gate. It stood there static for a second, spreading its wings and gazing out across the battlefield. Uh, suddenly, everything crashed back into motion. Artillery rounds were still howling in overhead, falling like rains on the gateway. The demon simply stood there, red-hot shell fragments pattering harmlessly off his hide, as he scanned the battlefield, looking for something. When he found it, one single beat of his massive bat-like wings sent him flying across the battlefield and straight into contact with the strike force. And with a ground-shattering bellow of corn, the monstrous axe held in his right hand came down and split asunder a red hunter's dreadnought, sharing the venerable machine clean in half. With the reverse strike, the Bloodthirster cut apart three Red Hunters standing nearby, and then launched itself further into the melee. Its next victim was a Grey Knight's Land Raider, blazing away at it with its sponsor and weaponry, but unable to reverse quickly enough. A single blow from the axe sent the Land Raider flying through the air, its hull buckled and crushed like a tin toy. And whilst the axe was reaping a bloody bounty for corn, the lash arm too whipped back and forth, sending it sneaking unnaturally out, claiming the lives of yet further Grey Knights and Red Hunters as well. Wherever the lash struck, no matter with how little apparent force, it crumpled power armor and tore men asunder. No regular force could ever hope to stand against such a creature, a being of slaughter made manifest. And yet, once again, this was the kind of enemy that the Grey Knights had been created to fight. Brother Captain Arturus, gathering his Grey Knights, charged the beast, and they all unleashed their psychic power towards it simultaneously, battering the towering monstrosity with waves of psychic force and lightning, shearing it into its skin, burning it, and ripping chunks of flesh from its body. Finally, something was working, and Angergrath roared its pain towards the sky before diving towards the Grey Knight. First slash of his axe catching one battle brother just above the hip and sending him flying, his armor having barely saved his life, but he was now laying gutted on the ground. The next battle brother was crushed beneath a massive hoof as the demon stomped down upon him, squashing him and crumpling his power armor. Yet still the Grey Knights came on, pouring yet more psychic power into the demon, causing it unimaginable pain. But the Grey Knight's psychic reserves were not infinite. Brother Captain Arturus blocked several blows from the massive demonic axe, pouring every last piece of strength and faith into augmenting his weapon to resist even the weapon of Korn's chosen champion, as his brethren laid into it with every weapon at their disposal. But one by one, the Grey Knight's numbers began to wilter and wane, until finally only the Brother Captain was left, trading blows with the town monstrosity, slicing into it, cutting it apart, even as it landed yet more and more telling blows upon him. Finally, the brother captain's strength was almost all but spent. One final effort, he raised his halberd and infused it with the last of his psychic potential to block one more blow from the bloodthirster. But this time, even his nemesis Fort Halberd could not stop the weapon, as it fell down with unresistible might, shattering the halberd and burying the blade all the way down into the brother captain's torso. 
The combat had lasted seconds, a minute at the most, and it had left the entire Grey Knight Strike Squad butchered in the Bloodthirster's wake. And yet that was still not the end of the demon's rampage. With the best of the Grey Knights defeated, the monstrosity launched itself into the rest of the advanced strike force, and for several more minutes it would run rampant, shattering almost the entirety of the Grey Knight force, and several other elite warriors of the Red Hunters along with tanks and dreadnoughts sent to stop it. But then, suddenly, Angrath turned towards the Cardinal Gate, and with one beat of its huge wings, it propelled itself away with breathtaking speed, leaving the remaining Grey Knights and the Red Hunters shocked and shattered. They barely constituted a threat anymore to Angrath, but there was one thing that could still be the end of him. And so he seized upon that target as his final victim. Once whatever was bearing that beacon of power over by the gate had been crushed beneath his mighty tread, there would be nothing left on this world to stop him, and he would be free to claim it in his master's name. Near the Cardinal Gate, Lord Hector Rex had been pushing forward with a small squad of stormtroopers and his personal retinue, trusting the Grey Knights to deal with the demon, but clearly the Bloodthirster had other plans. Slamming into the ground with a near meteoric impact, it shattered the permacrete beneath its thread, and immediately went on the offensive, the whip slashing out and claiming the lives of a squad of stormtroopers in a single crack. Next, the massive axe descended upon the source that had drawn it here, the beacon of power that still could hurt the mighty bloodthirster. But, unexpectedly, the mighty axe was checked. It met a wall as solid and unmovable as it itself was irresistible. Lord Inquisitor Hector Rex stood beneath the mighty blade with the storm shield in the form of the inquisitorial eye raised up high above him, blocking the axe, and in his hand was held a weapon that glowed with an intense golden light something that previously had been quite subdued. The Lord Inquisitor, however, did not have the time to ponder this strange happenstance, as the demon was clearly more than aware of what it signified. It launched attack after attack against the Lord Inquisitor, chipping away at his armor and his thunder shield. In the opening seconds of the fight, the Inquisitor could do naught but desperately defend himself. The servos in his power armor protesting loudly and screaming as they fought to resist the overwhelming strength of the demon. In short order, the Thunder Shield had been reduced to little more than worthless scraps shattered by repeated blows. Beneath the armor, the Lord Inquisitor's arm was near shattered and broken. Only thing keeping it up now was the armor itself locking into place to guard the Inquisitor. Dropping the shield, he forced himself, gritting his teeth through the pain, to wield the sword Arius two-handed, and somehow found the blade able to resist the demon's axe and repel its whip. Granted a moment of respite, the Lord Inquisitor lashed out with his own psychic power, cutting into the demon and weakening it. Angergrass screamed in pain, but only redoubled his assault, slashing even faster, even more furiously, and even more strongly towards the blade. But with every impact, the blade sang and glowed yet stronger. And yet, for all the qualities of the blade, the man wielding it was but a man, and Lord Inquisitor Hector Rex was being taxed to the very limit of his abilities. He was barely able to keep up with the Bloodthirster's constant lightning-swift attacks, and without his magnificent suit of power armor, his arms would have been shattered into a thousand pieces just trying to block. 
Holding on with all the strength he had, the Inquisitor pushed himself well beyond the limits of a mortal man, parrying more by instinct than anything, seemingly guided by something. He offered up a prayer to the God Emperor as the monstrous being roared in triumph, towering above him, stretching his axe up to the heavens and bringing it down. So fast the Inquisitor could barely see the blade coming in an earth-shattering blow. The demon was all fury, strength, and anger set to crush the last real threat on the entire planet. Its ultimate reward at its master's hand was oh so delectably close, and for a second it made the monster careless. It brought its weapon down with all the strength, all of the ferocity, and all of the anger and hatred it could muster, but none of the finesse that it had used against the Grey Knights. The Lord Inquisitor met the axe and tipped his blade ever so slightly, deflecting the axe blade, sending it hammering into the ground centimeters from his boot, and thrust the sword straight into the demon's heart. Roaring in anguish, the monster reared back and caught the Inquisitor with a backhand blow, a limb the size of a tree trunk hammering into the Lord Inquisitor's cuirass, shattering it, crumpling it, and sending him flying backwards. But it was too late. The sword was buried deep inside the demon's body. The glowing blade began to grow yet more fiercely, filling the demon with burning light that began to issue forth from its mouth, its ears, its eyes, in a torrent of burning fire. The demon, with one last scream to the heavens, imploded. The towering, horrifying monstrosity simply disappeared. All that remained was the sword, its golden light now extinguished, falling to the ground, landing, tipped down, and burying itself in the soft Vraxian soil. Only a slight stench of sulphur remained of the creature that had mere seconds ago threatened to turn the entirety of the planet into a charnel house. Having recovered consciousness from the blow that had sent him flying, and undoubtedly shattered a fair few of his bones as well, Lord Inquisitor Hector Rex released the safety catchers on his armor, so buckled bruised and dented now that it was little more than dead weight. Climbing out, he made his way over to where the sword had fallen. Gripping it with both hands, he pulled it forth from the Vraxian soil. The blade was now like any other blade, dull and bereft of the glorious golden light that had banished the demon. But certainly, the rumors of its origin seemed far more plausible now. The battle had almost stopped, hinging upon the outcome of the Lord Inquisitor's duel with the demon, and along with Angergrath, most of his followers had been banished as well, the psychic backlash of the demon's defeat scouring the battlefield almost completely clean of demonic entities. The few remaining ones, mostly lower rank demons like flesh hounds and other monstrosities, were being gunned down even now either by the stataco roar of bolt of fire, or by the shrieking beams of light issuing forth from Stormtrooper Hellguns. The Inquisitor looked up at the Cardinal Gate standing before him. Battered, bruised, and almost shattered by the artillery barrage, and then the arrival of Angergrath as well, having almost collapsed one of the mighty towers, the demon had almost done more damage to the mighty bastion than the artillery had. But no more enemies was issuing forth from within. The demons had been scoured from the field, and the Imperial forces were beginning to pick their way towards it, almost unsure of what had happened, what had become of the demon, and whether or not their lord was still alive. The bruised and battered Lord Inquisitor would have to go find himself a Vox set, and inform the rest of his army that the Cardinal Gate had been seized. And with that, the battle for now was over. The Red Scorpion's force was far too battered and bruised to make any immediate push out from the St. Leonis Gate. 
and to the east, the second strike force of Red Scorpions had been unable to gain any real traction against the Great Gate. As for the Lord Inquisitor's objective, the Cardinal Gate was on Imperial hands, but his strike force had been cut to ribbons. The arrival of Angergrath and his demonic hordes had reduced the Grey Knight's strike force to barely a handful of battered, bruised, and almost certainly combat ineffective survivors. As for the stormtroopers, they had fared little better, and the Inquisitors and their retinues? Not much better at all. It would be a small miracle if they were able to hold onto the gate, much less issue forth from within it. Now, they would have to reorganize. The Death Corps would have to bring up fresh reinforcements, fortify these positions, and then, finally, after so many years, the last task of the campaign could be begun. The only thing that stood between the 88th and victory now was the clearing out of the remaining areas of the Citadel. Mainly unfortified buildings and, of course, the capture of the Basilica itself. The war was almost at an end. But Vrax had one last surprise left to play on the Lord Inquisitor. Until next time, I have been Arch. Thank you all very much for watching, and I hope to see you all again soon. Have a good day.